Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Human Rights Chapter 3, written by Puzzle Headed Charge for Life as I Know It Is Over. It was the only thought Zarska's horror numbed mind could manage, ringing ceaselessly in his ears. At first, the war had been easy. The Zalask had a narrow technological edge over the humans and decades more experience in interplanetary combat. They had swept aside ineffectual human resistance over the farthest of their colony worlds and blitzed through their defenses towards the home territory. The initial success had been universally considered to be the first act of foregone conclusion. The Zalask were the elder superior species, so they would triumph. But then... The advance started as slow, as the humans revealed themselves to be tactically highly adaptable with technology that was, while crude, effective. Worse, their scientists were quick to reverse engineer captured hardware and then apply the principles they gleaned. The product of centuries of Zalask research, the horrifying new application no civilized, no sane being could ever imagine. Then, the humans launched their counteroffensive. And now, the Zraska was a prisoner of war. Every time he thought it stung him, it felt worse. The code! The code dictated that any soldier who was so derelict in his duty as to permit himself to be captured was shamed. He would forever bear the stigma of having failed the Azaliah. My parents will pretend to never have hatched a son. Zaska almost wished the humans would have killed him. The briefings that they'd had before deploying had described them as barely more than animals, with no code and history of inflicting appalling atrocities on one another no Zalas could ever imagine. Coexisting was simply impossible. High Command had determined, and has any species so warlike could eventually attempt to expand its Imperium by conquest. It was prudent, vital even, to deal with the humans before they could advance in technology. At first, some had thought the decision was hasty. After all, how much damage could such a primitive really do? Then the battlefield reports started coming back, as savagery in boarding actions and ground engagements that shocked the soul, of feints and ruses and deceptive tactics to which no being with honor would stoop, of a comfort with even affinity for nuclear detonations, with no regard for the sacrilege of tampering so profligately with the fundamental components of existence. They had known this race was violent, illogical, and animalistic. They had not anticipated the depths to which it could plunge. Reluctance disappeared, replaced with grim resolve, tempered by sharp with the knowledge that they were fighting for the very survival. However... The humans didn't seem interested in slaughtering their prisoners, at least not at the moment. They'd been unloaded in a camp that looked almost identical to a base, except the guards and the towers faced in instead of out. Okay, start with what you know. How would you treat them if the positions were reversed? The code was clear on the point of prisoners. Any being that lowered itself to surrender was not worthy of being fought against. And if they had thrown them their arms, then they were harmless and it would be dishonorable to attack them. If they had been overwhelmed and overpowered, then it would be dishonorable to kill them, as they were incapable of properly fighting back. However, all prisoners, by either the disgraced or the code or the membership of the opposing army, were too dangerous to code upholding Zalask to be permitted to live freely, so they were confined under guard in conditions appropriate for shame, to ensure that they did not violate the code further. This, of course, was rare. There was nothing to be gained by a shamed disregarding its station. Quite the opposite, it would become dishonored. Therefore, while prisoners were not worthy of good treatment, it would be dishonorable to expose them to poor treatment. All right, now the humans don't have the code, how are they likely to act? Well... He didn't know. Zaska knew almost nothing about the strange, stunted race with its dull, hooded eyes and grotesquely overlodged teeth. All right, boys, come on now, line up. The human guard was barking through the translator pin as the Zaska was reasonably sure as he was. And his components armed with the brutal human weapons that he'd learned they were called shotguns. 
herded the newly arrived prisoners towards several tables that had been set up in the open area in the middle of the camp. The shamed Zalask shuffled to comply, gradually clumping into lines before the humans seated behind the data scanners at the tables. Zaska kept his head bowed as the line advanced, miserably contemplating his boots. What would his sisters think when they heard that he'd committed such a dishonor? They will pay to be given a good fortune and die in battle, so as to erase the stain I've left on my own family. The thought somehow managed to find a new place in Zaska's tattered soul to the score wound. The former soldier in front of him stepped aside, and Zaska found himself face to face with the human. It was a she, with a hide of sickly white and fur of fearsome red. He wondered how in the world such a coloring could be natural. She, for her part, hadn't yet looked up. Name, rank, and serial number, she finally said through her translator pen, swiping a new screen on her data scanner. They had been instructed to provide this information, and even though the reason hadn't been given, orders were orders, so Zaska broke into an otherwise required silence. Zaska Duran, Private First Class 1272089. She tapped the information in, finally glancing up to look at him. All right, is there anything else you would like to tell us? Zaska's confusion must have been evident because she quickly elaborated. If you have a health condition you feel that we should be aware of, or if there is some information you wish to communicate to us, or a question that you would like to ask, now would be an excellent time. She waited expectantly. The radical departure from the ordinary treatment of shamed was completely frightening to the Zaska, who could only imagine such an ostensibly harmless interaction would quickly devolve into a kind of brutal interrogation they had been warned about in lurid detail. He shook his head mutely, remembering it was a human gesture meaning no, the equivalent of swiping one's tail over one's head. The human seemed unperturbed, merely saying, thank you, and gesturing for him to step to the next table. Zaska complied, and found himself now facing a much unfriendlier looking male, tapping busily on his data center. Duran, he barked, his voice nearly overpowering his translator. Zerska nodded frantically. Barracks 9, the human barked again already swiping to a new screen even as he waved Zerska aside. Zaska eagerly scattered away, joining the trickle of prisoners wandering about searching for the barracks. It was easy enough to locate. All the buildings had large numerals, both Zelask and human, painted all over the doors. His barracks was a prefab housing unit that wouldn't have been out of place on a Zelask base, except for the fact that, for some inexplicable reason, it was raised up off the ground on pilings. Does this area flood? Doesn't look like it. Humans were strange. His luminous eyes widened when he stepped inside and found another surprise, this time a welcome one. Their bunks all had pillows and blankets, comforts usually considered too much and too good for the shamed. What kind of creatures are these? Even though he had not yet had his meal for the day, Zask was too exhausted to be hungry. Without further thought or qualms, he selected a bunk at random and rolled himself up in the blanket, asleep as soon as he sank into the pillow. The morning started off with roll call. The guards, snarling in their awful, glattural language, hounded them out of bed and evicted them from the barracks, forcing them to stand in lines outside to be counted. Counted! What did they think that someone would vanish in the night? The humans in charge of the guards, a lean male with a heavy, knotted scarring over its entire left side of his face, even sinking into the empty socket where the eye must have been, bellowed the count to the officer that had appeared. The officer was even shorter, with close cropped brown fur, and leaned heavily on a stick held in his right hand. He acknowledged the count before pulling himself up to the clear intention of giving a speech. Why won't they just let us sleep? Greetings, gentlemen, the human began, shockingly in Zelask. My name is Colonel Robert McQueen, and I have been assigned as the Commandant of POW Camp 29, your home for the duration of the war. For those who still have not been informed, you are in the custody of the United States Navy. Under the jurisdiction of the United States Supreme Military Command, you are in the state of Idaho in the United States of America. The human paused, surveying the Zelask. His gaze gave Zerska an impression of being both punned down and x-rayed, unable to run and unable to hide. The human drew in a breath and continued, I imagine that you are wondering how you will be treated. 
as, for the first time in your lives, you are subject to the authority of beings who do not adhere to the code of Zelask. If you will forgive me for being so long-winded, I will endeavor to explain to you how we humans view the situation, so that we can try and avoid a misunderstanding as much as possible. Huh? In your culture, I understand that beings taken prisoner are regarded as shameful. We don't see that it that way. We see it as merely one of the possible consequences of doing one's duty. It is for that reason that we accord prisoners a war greater self-responsibility than you would think appropriate. The ranking officers amongst you have been informed of their rights and duties as such, and they have risen admirably to the task. The human cleared his throat and Zaska noticed the first time a thin, bright red scar arcing along his forehead, disappearing into his fur. He felt a prickling sweep of unease under his scales. The few wounded humans he had seen all appeared to have recovered from injuries that looked as though they would have been fatal to his Alaska. Oh, how he hated this relentlessly unnatural creatures. Further, our culture does not have or concept of shamed as you understand it. Therefore, we neither follow nor expect to see you follow codes of conduct that you would believe appropriate. Rather, we treat you as you what you would treat us, enemy soldiers. As such, you will be subject to constraints necessitated by captivity, some of which will appear to you as excessive or even unjustified. However, you will also be accorded the rights that we believe is due to all sentients, whether they have scales or skin, and the honor earned by those who fight. The specific laws and regulations governing how these principles shall be applied to you are enumerated in the Geneva Conventions, a series of four treaties. Although your high command is not a signatory, the protections and privileges contained therein have been extended to you. The human's eyes were bright, the lower jaw thrust forward. Zaska recognized this as an expression of defiance, but he could not think against what. He also had never heard of a Geneva Conventions, nor had he even known what humans were capable of framing treaties. The ability to broker and uphold compromises was supposed to be beyond this violent species. The Commandant's expression shifted again to, uh, grim, uncomfortable even. Zgarska felt dread clawing up his belly as he thought of whatever was so terrible as to make this human in power over them all look haunted. Yet the human lifted his chin and continued, I know some of you have read human history and are acquainted with some of the crimes my species committed against itself in the past. I want to state, as strongly as possible, that crimes are exactly what they are, paper copies of Third Geneva Conventions, the one most applicable to your situation, have been placed in the wreck and mess halls for your perusal. Should you witness a violation of the Geneva Conventions, please inform me. It is your right to report such infractions to the International Committee of the Red Cross, and it is your duty to make me aware of them as well, so that we can discipline the personnel responsible. What in the name of Zial? It was incomprehensible. This human was freely admitting that his soldiers might violate their own code, committing the deepest dishonor. But at the same time, he seemed willing to take the prisoner's side against his own military, which, um... If he truly defended them as he promised to, was upholding the highest honor. What species was capable of supporting both? Humans, apparently. And what were these Geneva Conventions he kept talking about? Prisoners shouldn't need protections and didn't deserve privileges. Why were the humans offering them both? And the one hand, it was deeply concerning. And on the other, what being would want to turn down a privilege? He'd had to read these conventions then. I hope then we will be able to tolerate our differences, the Commandant was concluding, so that we can try to live together as comforting as possible. I understand that your culture disdains much of the behavior that is uh, fundamental to mine, but I am nevertheless compelled to state that should you choose to engage in acts that harass or endanger my personnel, or should you attempt to escape, you will be dealt with. In that moment, the diminutive damaged human was the most impressive living being that Zaska had ever encountered. He seemed to exude strength and control that surpassed physical capability, even mental acuity. The Zalask, for all their checkered record and judgment, were correct when they called themselves brave, and they feared this human. The human nodded once, satisfied his prisoners understood. Very well, dismissed. The vast majority of the Zalask dragged back to their barracks to sleep, still in the shocked misery of the capture more overwhelmed than informed by the Commandant's words. 
Zaska, however, set off in search of the mess hall and a copy of the Geneva Convention. It wasn't hard to find, empty at this time of day, though he could hear the banging coming from the kitchen as the work of preparing the daily meals for the 200 Zelask who had suddenly arrived commenced. On the table by the doors were several piles of paper, printed in Zelask lettering, as well as the blocky human alphabet. He scanned the titles, feeling more and more confused. Basic English vocabulary, said one, listing ordinary words like food and soldier with guides on how to pronounce them in the hideous human tongue, as if any Zelask would ever stop to speak with the tongue of animals. American culture, proclaimed another apparently in reference to the tribe that had captured him, a species still divided into tribes after developing heavier than air flight, let alone FDL travel, was mind-boggling to Zaska. This tribe apparently loved something called barbecue, had an obsession with balls being placed in baskets, and was frighteningly well-armed. He supposed that this was a neurosis was it due to the fear of invasion. Ping-pong tournament, declared the third, with what had to be a translator malfunction. Finally, the center of the table was a stack entitled the Third Geneva Convention, relative to the treatment of prisoners in war, 1949. Zaska snatched up the pamphlet, fearful that the last moments this would turn into some trick of human amusement. He fled back to his barracks. Almost everyone else had fallen asleep again, so Zaska bundled himself up in the blankets and opened up the pamphlet to read. And as he read, however, his confusion, rather than diminishing, grew. Prisoners of war must at all times be humanely treated, any unlawful act of omission by the detaining power causing death or seriously endangering the health of a prisoner of war in custody is prohibited. Likewise, prisoners of war must at all times be protected, particularly against acts of violence or intimidation and against all insults and public curiosity. Measures of reprisal against prisoners of war are prohibited. Prisoners of war are entitled to all circumstances to respect for their persons and their honor. While respecting the individual preferences of every prisoner, the detaining power shall encourage the practice of intellectual, educational, and recreational pursuits, sports, games amongst prisoners, and shall take the measures necessary to ensure exercise thereof by providing them with adequate premises and necessary equipment. Collective punishment for individual acts, corporal punishment for imprisonment in premises without daylight, and, in general, any form of torture or cruelty are forbidden. Each high contractory party shall be measured necessary for the suppression of all acts contrary to the provisions of the present convention. It was like nothing Zaska had ever encountered. The Zalask treated the prisoners neither kindly nor poorly, while the humans seemed to feel that the prisoners were entitled to good treatment. Yet, if these laws were anything to go by, often visited upon the atrocities of his mind recalled to contemplate, but there was something more. What kind of species could write such laws? It bespoke of an extraordinary degree of self-awareness coupled with an equally great lack of self-control. They seemed to be attempting to legislate away their very psychology. It was very alien. Zaska put the treaty down and rolled upright, his mind whirling. It would be good to walk, a trying to make sense of this. Article 38 says that I can go outside. So he steeled himself and stood, ignoring the vaguely curious glances that the few comrades who were still awake gave him. He slipped out the door. As he walked, he really looked around for the first time. The area, for all its ugly purpose, was beautiful. Tall mountains, like those found near the poles of Dizlaya, reared up in the horizon, with straight dark level plains softening their flanks. White snow crowned the peaks, making a lovely contrast to the sky. The same ethereal roaring blue of iron driver exhaust. The air was cool, but the Zaska uniform was enough to keep him warm. Some of the plants were a different color. Zaska noticed he's pricking his long forked tongue with curiosity. They were gold, short, and then green ones, the only lower down on the mountains. Wanting a better view, he walked towards the fence, noticing the thin wire strung on pegs in the ground a short distance in front of it. He wondered what it was for. Hey, you, stop. Zaska froze, terror flashing back over him in an instant. Oh, he knew this treaty was a joke, and now the humans were going to torture him. One of the guards came running, out of the breath and angry. 
What do you think you're doing, going up to the deadline like that? The human demanded, and the translator pin unnecessarily in communicating his displeasure. I, I, I was only, I, I wanted to look at the plants. Zaska garbled frantically. Please don't kill me. The guard frowned, apparently confused by the answer. What? The plants? What plants? He asked suspiciously, tipping his head back to be able to look at Zaska in the eye. Zaska found the human's lustless eyes unsettling, even unnatural. He had always thought his own eyes, which glowed brighter than average, were a deep, clear violet, with the best features. Females agreed. Not that it matters now or ever again. Those plants, Zaska said lamely, timidly pointing his claw to the feathery gold growth on the slopes. The human, still scowling, turned to look. What? You mean the aspens? His expression loosened slightly. You don't have those in your planet. Oh no, Zaska said hurriedly, eager to continue modifying the human. Nothing like them. They're incredible. They are, aren't they? The human agreed, smiling slightly, though the wary look of the leaf in his eyes. I grew up not too far from here, in Eagle. They're always my favorite part of the fall. Fall? What has fallen? Zask asked, puzzled. He stood and stared and burst out laughing. The translators really aren't all that they're advertised to be, are they? He said wryly. Fall is our word for one of Earth's seasons. When the hemisphere is tilting away from the sun, the trees sense the sunlight is getting weaker and drop the leaves for the winter. Oh, I suppose fall is a reasonable name for that. Zaska privately thought in his own species name for the time of shedding. Shush! Or better captured the feeling of the season. The Zalask and the human lapsed into a silence, staring at each other while the mismatched eyes. It was a surreal interaction to be talking calmly about vegetation with someone who, under different circumstances, they would try their best to kill and maim each other. But why did you attack us? The human asked abruptly, opaque eyes somehow still being able to express curiosity as the luminous orbs of the Zalask. Zaska considered he could tell the truth, he supposed, without damaging the war effort. It wasn't a secret. High Command simply hadn't deemed it worth their while to dignify humans with a formal enumeration of their thoughts. It might have been a duty to lie, to spread confusion amongst the human forces, but he realized he didn't want to. Humans seemed to be willing to share as much of themselves, had shared so much, of their culture and history and psychology and something deeper. That underlay all of those and gave them form and life through that treaty. Because our evaluators deemed you uncivilized, Zaska found himself speaking frankly. High Command realized coexistence with you was impossible. The human nodded slowly, lower jaw jutting out. And what gave them that impression? He asked suddenly. He seemed to be struggling internally with what Zaska couldn't imagine. You have no code, as we have, or at least we did not think you did. Zaska hissed in confusion. Yet you have this treaty. It is a code, but it seems to be written with the expectation that your people would break it. I do not understand what sort of species knows what it should do, yet does the opposite. Zaska's voice had risen angrily by the end of the question. It was in this, the inherent tendency towards code breaking, which separated humans and the Zalask, which made their war necessary. He wanted furiously to hear the human explain himself, to watch him realize his people must accept responsibility for the slaughter of millions, the shattering of worlds, the sweeping destruction that would only be prelude to the complete annihilation. The human, however, seemed genuinely mystified. Well, it's like any law, isn't it? There's always be people who breaks it, for one reason or another. It's just a part of human nature. So, Zaska exclaimed, drawing himself up to his full height. He towered over his misshapen human. You admit it. Your evolution precludes you from being civilized members of the galaxy. That is why we had to attack you. Now, just a damn minute, the human snarled, firing up as well. Even though he was physically much less imposing, his anger was somehow more intimidating. You can't say that your species doesn't have crime. Of course we do. When we eliminate code breakers, Zaska snapped, we expunge their names from our records, their lives from our history. We do not permit them to sway others from the code. We would never need to have a clause like Article 129 in these treaties. Yeah, because you wouldn't have a damn treaty in the first place, the human rage. My cousin got captured six months ago. I know what you really are behind your code. You treated him like animals. Well, Zaska frowned, you, you're worse. We treated them the way they thought was right. You treat people the way you know is wrong. 
but we try to get better, the human yelled. Can you jerks say the same? What in the darkness do you mean? Zaska snapped, lashing his tail in frustration. If you know what you do is wrong, do not do it. Well, it's not that simple for us, the human snarled, grinding his teeth in a threatening way. It's human nature to do crap like that, but we always try and be better than we are. You frickers are just convinced that you are the master race. Zaska opened his mouth furiously to his back, but suddenly nothing came. His violet eyes, having grown bright and beacons of anger, flashed as he blinked. Every species reacted differently when it ascended into the galactic community, but there were two constants in the biopsychologists considered absolutely universal. The species in question would try and improve its technology or organization to match a superior elder, and yet it would remain unshakably convinced that just as it had been the pinnacle of moral development on its homeworld, it was still in the wider galaxy. The idea that a species might realize its nature was inferior, especially before first contact, when these creatures had believed themselves alone in the universe, shattered a paradigm that had held true for every race of beings yet known. How did any species live with the knowledge that it was a failure by its own standards? According to this human, they did it by trying to overcome being human, and view that effort as the most basically human thing they did. It was mind-blowing. How do you live like this? Zaskar asked, his incomprehension bordering on wonder. The human seemed irritated, as though Zaskar had asked how gravity kept the feet to the floor. Because it's what we're born to do, right? He doesn't even realize that they're the only ones in the galaxy who are. Zaskar flicked his tongue in confusion. It seemed that he would never stop feeling. The human was visibly startled. Dear Zaya, what must their tongues look like? The human abruptly seemed tired of the philosophy. Look, whatever, just don't go stomping up to the deadline like that again, okay? If, I don't know, a ball goes across it or something, ask permission to go and get it. If you step over the wire, the tower guards will shoot you. The human indicated some of his fellows esconded up behind the vicious primitive projectile weapons the humans favored. Zaska nodded in his understanding. All right. The human turned and walked off leaving Zaskar alone with the rising breeze. He shivered, though it had not yet become that much colder. He couldn't name, much less articulate the sensation that gripped him, but it left him with the certainty that the humans, these insane, incomprehensible humans, for all of their inferiority, would somehow one day surpass this Alaska. He pressed a hand on his breast pocket, feeling the crackle of the primitive paper on which the humans had set down his declaration and aspiration, and in its purpose and origin was beyond what any other species could dream of. They already have. With that dreadful thought of company, Zaska turned from the fence and walked back towards his barracks. A thought struck him as he went, seeing the suspicion on the faces of the guards as he passed. How are the human prisoners behaving? End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.